Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'm Sumit. I lead a small team of kernel engineers in the LCG uh, um, LCG segment group. Um, we are just going to talk about a few things that we've been working on uh, through past six months. So the agenda would be uh, John would talk about ion destaging, DMA heaps, and uh, he will also talk about Hikey 960 updates. Uh, then Amit is going to talk about the progress that we made on trying to run a mainline kernel on Pixel 3 device. Uh, Yonkin is going to talk about the LCR status, while Shaolyu uh, will uh, give us a status on ASP TV. Uh, TV. Orson couldn't be here uh, uh, for Connect, so I'm going to stand in for him and talk about LTP, DDT, and Hikey for a little bit. So over to John. Hey, so I'm John Stoltz. I'm going to talk about the ion destaging work that we're going on and the Hikey 960 updates. Um, so first, uh, the ion destaging. Um, so this is, uh, I guess, ion went into staging uh, I think 2011, um, so it's been there for a while. Um, and while there's been some small changes, it hasn't seen a, a, a lot of uh, progress in, in getting upstream, um, at least properly. Um, and so part of the problem is that ION is this big kind of hairy solution to a bunch of problems. Um, and so trying to, you know, despite a lot of number of efforts, uh, you know, Summit and Benjamin have both uh, taken good swings at uh, trying to get some functionality upstream. Um, th this attempt is trying to just kind of cut off a very small portion of it, uh, just the allocation API, trying to clean up some of the, th the suggestions that we've gotten uh, to the ION code over the years. Um, and basically the idea is instead of uh, uh, having a big multiplexer in the ION interface um, where you had to spe specify, you know, query for the heaps and then pick which ones you wanted to use in order to get uh, just to the allocation point, um, we're basically breaking it up so that we have uh, per heap device nodes. And so this means that you'll have something like a dev DMA heap uh, system and dev DMA heap CMA and whatever custom heap you might want. Um, in a lot of ways, this simplifies the API. Um, but it also uh, uh, gives a lot more flexibility to the heap implementation because they get to implement the DMA buff ops. Um, since the API is a lot simpler, at least in the current RFCs, um, there is some concern, uh, particularly around secure heaps, uh, whether or not we've oversimplified it to make it difficult to actually handle uh, some of the needs of secure heaps. Um, but at the same time, too, I'm because I feel like part of the problem with getting ion upstream is uh, we keep on getting tangled into trying to solve all the problems um, very quickly. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to maybe even see that, you know, if, if the DMA heaps can't work for all secure heaps, maybe secure heaps need a, their own interface too. So it's, it's one of those things where I'm, I'm not sure if uh, we have to solve it all. Um, but RFC sent out last week um, at the URL there. Feedback would be lovely. Uh, we'd like to get as much input as we can on this um, to make sure we're not missing anything. Um, and also because, you know, we can't push anything uh, ion related without getting tangled into all of the problems. Um, there's also discussion going on between uh, folks at uh, Google and Qualcomm and ARM um, and uh, TI uh, trying to figure out how we can um, uh, handle some of the uh, cache operation overhead that the DMA buffs currently have. Um, this is something that uh, we've seen with the ION code recently where some of the cleanups that Laura uh, Abbott has done, um, basically uh, in order to kind of provide the correctness that Upstream wants, uh, had performance consequences. And so trying to find out a way to either change how Android's using the DMA buffs or change the, some of the DMA buff APIs in order to allow uh, uh, you know, us to avoid uh, this cache overhead is something we're going to be doing. I'm working on uh, trying to document this and so I'm not sure exactly what the format of that conversation will uh, uh, kind of be, what, what, what product will come out of that. Um, but uh, it might be an LWN article or something. But please come and contact me um, if you uh, uh, have any uh, interest in that area. Uh, next is the Hikey 960 upstreaming. Um, so UFS has landed, their support has landed in 4.19. So right now you can boot uh, device off storage. Um, with mainline kernel. Uh, DMA engine support landed uh, just recently in 5.1. Um, the USB support's being very actively pushed, uh, I guess right before this conference, uh, the V5 was sent out, so I'm hopeful that uh, we'll see that land in the 5.2 merge window. Um, I2S and core site support also being pushed. Um, 
And then the DRM driver uh, is being currently reworked um, so that it's able to basically extend the already upstream uh, Kirin uh, uh, DRM driver that we use on Hikey. Um, and so that's kind of taking some more work, but I think it'll be a, a better patch set. Um, I did want to say thanks to Dr. Sue and the High Silicon team, uh, basically for them, you know, they, they've come back to, to do a lot of this uh, heavy lifting on the upstreaming, and it's, it's very much appreciated. Um, as far as our to-dos on Hikey 960, um, want to finish the upstreaming. Um, also want to see about uh, trying to get some Panfrost uh, support uh, working on it. Um, that just would be great to have uh, the device be fully uh, kind of working in a just only upstream uh, support or upstream framework. Um, the transition to the UEFI bootloader by default has been uh, kind of a constant problem. We've run into all these kind of mysterious problems with some users. Um, and that's recently been diagnosed down to a problem with specific uh, UFS uh, chips that have problems with the UFI code at the moment. Um, so that's been narrowed, and, and hopefully we'll have resolution there soon. And then we have, you know, lots of bugs, of course. Um, it's, the Hikey 960 has still been really, really valuable um, for ASP development. Um, it is basically kind of the test harness for the DRM hardware composer. You know, it's, it's not the most interesting uh, use for the DRM hardware composer, but it, it is kind of the one device that we have upstream running, and we can use it for validating um, that makes sure no regressions uh, sneak into the DRM hardware composer code. Um, it's, again, been useful for things like the DMA heaps, the uh, ion destaging work uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, it's been able to validate that all of that's working, and we can compare it with ion, so it gives us a real nice uh, uh, baseline for doing all that testing. Um, also, folks at Google Gallister, if he's over there, <laughs> has been using it for things like uh, dynamic partitions and uh, uh, the recovery uh, work that's going on uh, in AOSP. Um, and so it, it's, it, I'm sure other things that start with D have been supported here too. Um, but uh, it, it's one of those things where um, it just really has been super useful. So it's, I'm going to hope, hopefully be able to keep it uh, uh, supported as long as we can. And I think that's it for me. So on to Amit. I don't know, unless any quick questions. So the Hikey 960 differed from the original Hikey in that the tool for um, doing the recovery mode is only available as an x86 binary. Is there any work ongoing on that, uh, either to make binaries available for ARM64 or to open source that? Yeah, so that, that, that has been a sticking point for recovery. Um, we've, we've tried as hard as we can to just make it so you didn't have to do recovery, um, at least in the AOSP side of things. Um, but yes, no, that, that is a known pain point. Um, there's some issues with the, I think, the RAM initialization that's just proprietary, so we can't have that open. So, I don't know. All right, go on, go on. Oh, oh sorry. I, I just wanted, to, I, when I looked at the DRM driver, or at least on the original high gear, and he supported one plane, so I just, that just didn't seem like a very good Correct. test uh, driver it, for it, the it, hardware. It, it is, it is uh, very limited uh, uh, as far as, uh, kind of the interesting aspects of the DRM hardware composer. But we are able to exercise at least enough of the paths that it, it's caught a lot of troubles <laughs> uh, so you. far. And so, it, and we don't really have any other platform. I mean, uh, there's uh, some of the dragon boards we've used um, to do some yeah, testing Yeah, I was going to say DB410C um, kind of. Yeah, it's kinda. tough. That's a low memory system, so it's hard to get it all the way up in uh, Android. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's, 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 it, Because if we, we, we have, apart from that, we really have no example code in ASP. Right. And so folks that are bringing up boards, and you know, as Google's now pushing for DRM KMS drivers from vendors, it's good to have something in AOSP, even if it is just very basic. Um, and so HiKey is the only way right now that we keep that working, because it's the only target that's actually using DRM Harbor Composer. We're hoping to add another one. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it, there's more than just having exciting DRM KMS functionality. Yeah. Just having it there is useful. Also, I want to touch on one of the other things you mentioned. Uh, with your DMA buff heaps rework, it strikes me that this, the caching uh, situation is no worse with that than it was than it is with the current ion upstream, right? Yeah, that I is mean, correct. That it, code might have that functionality may have been removed over time upstream, but the current upstream code is basically yeah. Equivalent. So it, the DMA buff uh, implementation has the same performance characteristics as the upstream ion. Um, we are trying to address that separately. I'm trying to keep that as a separate problem as much as I can, but it's one of those things that uh, we definitely don't want to run into a situation where we upstream an interface and then realize, oh, this isn't going to work for you know that. So we kind of want to have a little bit of a holistic picture there. Um, but with that, I probably should let my time move on so I can get through the hour. 
Hi, my name is Amit. So I'll be talking about running mainline kernel on Pixel 3. So this work largely stands on the shoulders of Qualcomm lending team because they have, I mean, I think almost all the platform bits are already upstream for SDM 845, if you have been following uh, LKML closely. So a big shout out to uh, Qualcomm lending team and Beyond in particular, because he have been helping me a lot getting uh, Pixel 3, sorry, uh, mainline kernel booting on Pixel 3. So yeah, as I was talking about, uh, uh, most of the work which I have done is by leveraging the Qualcomm lending team's work. And Beyond has a, so I think a couple of weeks ago, uh, Thundercom released a developer platform called DB845C. So it's a Dragon Board uh, next revision. So Beyond has a, had a working tree and with most of the things working. And so the starting point for this work is history. I took history and uh, it was not booting initially and then just did a quick diff on the stock kernel. And I realized that there are a couple of uh, uh, compatible strings which were missing from the mainline tree. So I picked those board IDs and MSM IDs from the stock kernel, just replaced, just added those in the mainline uh, DB845C uh, DTS tree, and things started moving, right? Uh, so this slide is a bit old. So right now we have RC2 booting with UFS working. And the good thing is that even the ADB, right? All the platform steps are already upstream. So ADB just worked straight away. I did not have to do anything. There was one uh, upstream uh, function FS bug, which uh, John pointed out that maybe this is something which is biting you. And as long, I mean, as soon as I had that particular fix in place, ADB started working again. The same thing with Bluetooth. All the firmwares are already in the Linux firmware directory. I should have possibly, I should have probably added the uh, URLs there. Uh, so Bluetooth is working from the command line as long as I can see that the scan, I mean, it should probably scan. Oh, Pixel 3 ships with two UFS, uh, uh, U, uh, two UFS. One is uh, based on SK Hynix and other one is Micron. So the phones which have SK Hynix UFS, they, they work. The ones which, they, which have Micron, they don't boot. So there's, there's some kind of uh, incompatibility there. We are still figuring out what is going wrong there. So that's in uh, my to-do list right now. Uh, yeah, so UFS works, mounting works, ADB, Bluetooth. <laughs> so the story behind UFS is that they use the same driver which they use in stock kernel. So for me, I just copy pasted the same f-stab entry or the, no, the pretty much the same f-stab entry and it started booting again. Uh, it started booting. So. So that's how that mount thing worked. Uh, issues to do things which we have right now is, as I mentioned, that Pixel 3 phones which ship with UF, uh, Micron UFS, they don't boot. Uh, display is currently not in a good state, uh, something which we are working on right now. Uh, there, is, there are some incompatibilities in between IOMMU and bootloader splash screen. So when you actually go and try to boot uh, mainline kernel on Pixel 3 without actually disabling the boot splash screen. It doesn't boot. So you have to disable the uh, panel driver uh, in the bootloader as well. Uh, reboot reason support is something, yeah, it's a very low priority thing, but something which is good to have instead of just keep pressing those key combinations to uh, go into uh, reboot, uh, sorry, bootloader mode. Uh, I can do a quick demo if you guys are interested in that. There it is. There 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 is. So the story behind the, uh, 
it, so to, 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 to get it booting up to a completing stage is that I'm using Swift shader right now. So my initial plan was to use virtual frame buffer and to get some kind of virtual, I mean, because that's what we've been using in the past based on the default GRLock implementation. But default GRLock, GRLock implementation doesn't support OpenGLES 2.0 and plus versions. So uh, John pointed me out to try out Swift shader. So I tried Swift shader and at least I, I got the OpenGLES version, but the the glue that I the, which the driver the display part where uh, what should I say right the equivalent of virtual frame buffer in DR and KMS right so that thing is something which is still missing and uh, Swift shader crashes in between so the hook which I came up with here is that in the EGL layer. I don't swap the buffers. I don't pass the buffer to driver. I just say that, okay, I have passed something. So once I do that, I mean, Android system thinks that I have booted to UI and it just keeps going on. So that's why you see here that the, it has booted to completion. Uh, that's pretty much I had. <laughs> I don't have much uh, to discuss about actually here. It just boots to console and I'm not sure if it is really interesting or not. I, I think so. <laughs> <I'm excited. laughs> So if you have any questions, then. I should have probably uh, put the URL for the source code, but yeah. yeah. D I guess uh, plans for documentation, we probably should talk about what we're going to share. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully soon we'll have something to yeah, share publicly. <laughs> so, Yunkin. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Yunqin. Uh, here I will uh, just give a short introduction about uh, uh, the LCR build data. Uh, the, uh, we have uh, LCR builds based on different uh, Android versions. Uh, the builds that are based on master, we use, uh, use it to uh, check boot, uh, build broken problems and boot problems. Um, for the build, uh, th there uh, for the build broken problems. Uh, may most of the reason uh, has been re uh, written in the build system changes for Android MK writers f uh, document. Um, so uh, that's uh, mainly uh, caused by the Android building system changed in the OSP master. So if you have some. Uh, build broken problems with the OS master, you can check that uh, document. Mm. The pi based build uh, is what uh, uh, we are working on we are working on now. Um, the hacky hacky build already uh, released. Uh, we are working on TI uh, TIX fifteen and AM uh, six five X uh, platforms for the release. Uh, the oral based builds, uh, we have no development on it and uh, it will be disabled later. Uh, so there are also some derived builds like the OPET uh, builds and the TV LCR builds. Uh, you can connect to the uh, maintainers for if you are interested in. Uh, besides the uh, work on Android builds, we also developed developed uh, a system for test report management. Uh, now we have uh, we could show trend charts for uh, uh, CTS or VTS failures. Um, we also uh, integrated with the Linano Bugzilla to report bugs and. Uh, a list of bugs from the bugzilla. Uh, we also uh, add one page add pages to show the failures uh, for VTS and the CTS test. There we show uh, like uh, the fa uh, the failure uh, is uh, hap uh, happened for only 64 uh, bit platform or f uh, fixed for both both uh, 32. And uh, 
the 64 platforms. Or we can show the failure if it only happened for X15, uh, Hacky, but not for uh, X15. So we also want to add some features to, uh, to make the bug, uh, bug investigation or uh, failure check easy uh, in the future. So also uh, need some uh, uh, change on the on the system itself, like make it uh, could be accessed via the normal uh, 18, 80 uh, port or accessed via HTTPS protocol, something like that. Uh, yeah, that's, I think that's all. Any questions? Okay, thank you. So next is Shalu. Uh, hi, I'm sure this is a very uh, short update for LSP TV status. Then uh, currently, uh, I'm in the, I'm assigning from uh, from Social Next and, and in charge of the LSP TV related, related task. Uh, and also, uh, many work on uh, DRM uh, with sync with uh, MWG and and, and SWG. Uh, and for uh, for uh, the DM and and I'm trying to uh, have to have a uh, uh, pre ready uh, secure time support on LS, uh, on Android LSP TV and with Apti. So currently, uh, I already have already able to have some uh, uh, secure time support uh, in. Um, Permission more with some additional manually step. For example, I need to have some have uh, some initial time clock in clock in uh, TE size uh, for high key because there is no 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 mechanism to uh, reset the, uh, to make the uh, uh, time clock on counting on TE side. And also, I want to. Uh, we we o we also have plan to have some CI loop uh, uh, to make sure uh, every component uh, work fine if some some component upgrade. So uh, for a future plan, and actually, Barrow already have some very uh, complete plan for LSP TV, and I, I just. Uh, uh, separate to uh, short term and and long term. For uh, short term plan, we 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 will have some bring more uh, development board uh, support for LSP TV, uh, like LD20 and and MS AM. Of course, more is work, and also set up some uh, some man, uh, set and maintain uh, LSP uh, master based on LSP built in TV configuration, just like Haiki, maybe we were more like LCR released. And for a long term, we, we want to add, uh, we have some uh, additional input source for LSP TV and also uh, bring some uh, BRE IR support and more like uh, HDMI CEC support in kernel and health. And that's it for my part, thank you. Thank you, Shalyu. Uh, so Orson couldn't be here at this connect, so I'm just going to fill in for him and uh, talk a little bit about what he's done on LTPDDT on the high key. Um, very short set of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'll just give a quick intro on uh, what is LTPDDT, why do we need it or use it, how does it work, and what was the exact quantum of work that was uh, undertaken under this uh, a question around whether it is possible or, uh, uh, I mean, we are looking at the possibility whether it should be merged into LTP itself. Can it run in containers? So 
So what is LTP DTT? It is uh, basically a fork of LTP code base. Uh, which tests about, it added about a thousand new test cases uh, for, uh, um, which are compliant to, uh, to the LTP way of writing test cases. Uh, it was developed by Texas Instruments uh, and it is uh, for their, it was meant for their specific devices. So DDT is basically device driver tests. It covers about 40 subsystems of uh, driver's directory, under di driver's directory of the Linux kernel. So the official URL is, is right here. Um, you can look at it. Why would we use LTP DDT? So uh, it's quite helpful to check device drivers. Uh, it's basically one of the uh, single largest repository that we could find for unit tests that uh, uh, examine and exercise testing of device drivers uh, for ARM devices. Um, it use, you can use a specific platforms to select different test suite configurations for different boards. So we added support for uh, HiKey uh, 6220. Um, a lot of test cases are only cared off or uh, I mean they're important or uh, useful for embedded devices like UART, SPI, SQRC, um, maybe MMC. Uh, the limitations that, as of today, LTP DDT has is basically many tests are designed for TI device drivers only, so that's a big chunk of what we've been trying to do. Um, there is an absence of auto detection mechanism to skip unnecessary tests. Uh, maybe the authors thought that this should be deselected by the platform selection that you do, so that's something we like to need to discuss when we uh, try and upstream it to the LTP community. There are some unusual commands that uh, the tests depend on, but they're not included in the LTP DDT themselves. So we found that the hardware where suddenly a few tests failed because we used a different uh, root FS. Um, how does it work? It's a very short, um, I mean, it's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, you clone it from the LTP DDT git, you just run like LTP, run LTP, minus P is the platform that you want to run for, and uh, minus F is the test that you want to run. And then you can check the logs of how the tests uh, have failed. Um, the main changes to original LTP have been in the platform uh, directory, then some test cases, DDT directory, and run test slash DDT. What did we do? So we added platforms for uh, adding high key upstream. So there were patches that got sent to uh, DDT and TI's DDT repository. Now uh, you can download from there and run it for high key. Uh, there were 47 test suites that we uh, selected. And this was about a few hundreds of uh, test cases that we ran for high key. There's a list, there's a link, so you can um, have a look at the list that we selected. We ran it on high key and uh, naturally we got hundreds of failures, so we started clearing those up. Um, and uh, we managed to clear out a few things. So like ARMV, ARMV star um, uh, tests, we, uh, they're all, they are all passing now with four fixes that were uh, submitted upstream. Here upstream is the LTP DDT git that TI maintains, not LTP. Um, watchdog uh, tests got all passed with one bug fix. UART all passes uh, with the two patches. GPIO is passing partly, but there's some test logic that needs some redesign. MMC is mostly passing, there is, there is one patch. Can we merge it back to LTP? So these are Orson slides. Um, it is derived from uh, LTP. LTP DDT is derived from LTP, so it, the code structure has not changed drastically. It's not something totally new, so it's, uh, Probably, uh, I mean, it should be easy to do that. Also, the uh, LTP DDT is rebased on latest LTP tree, but uh, it, I think, hasn't been done in some time. Probably that's what he means there. I don't know. Um, as a few cons that might uh, we might face while we try to upstream it, uh, we are not sure that LTP will accept platform-based selection because the impression that LTP gives is that it focuses only on general Linux interfaces, uh, not caring about architecture or boards and so on. So that's probably something we'll need to uh, talk about with the LTP 
upstream maintainers and the community. And uh, there are certain cases where some uh, kernel modules needed to be inserted. There are tests written which check for kernel modules to be inserted. So uh, I don't think LTP has that support, but I could be wrong. Can we run these in containers? So the motivation there is that uh, it often depends on a lot of external tools, and there is no way to check and install those tools right now. So can we containerize the run of LTP DDT so you can just uh, have one virtual container that can do it. I think the challenge there was that uh, there should be a possibility to have the containers uh, uh, to be able to access dev and sys devices. I'm not sure if that is, I, I'm not a big container person, so I'm not sure if that is possible. And then kernel modules naturally depend on kernel versions, so that's another uh, challenge. I think that's all that he had. I don't guarantee that I'll be able to answer your questions, but I'll try. Um, can you um, say a few words more about what those tests are actually doing, like how they work, and are they sharing any code with the existing LTP tests, or is it just like the test harness that is being reused from LTP? Uh, I think it's the test harness that is being reused, because most of the tests are uh, specific device driver tests, like for an I2C specific chip that they're testing using the LTP harness. So uh, I don't think there's going to be a lot of existing code that is going to be common between these. This is more towards a uh, specific device driver kind of test, whereas as I understand, LTP tries to focus more on framework level testing. I could be wrong. So in other words, it would be possible to simply adopt a different test runner framework and like, keep the tests. Um, and you know, like keep it separate from LTP if they don't want to accept the DDP instead of keeping it as a fork of it. LTP. Possibly, I'll we'll have to see. But if you have any ideas around, if you know of any other frameworks that would uh, let us do that, okay, good, thanks. So, um, C Cyril, the maintainer of LTP, he, he, you don't have any sort of initial feeling from him as to whether he'd be uh, open We haven't done that yet because we wanted to see how easy it was or difficult it was to try and add another platform. So this exercise has been going on for, uh, I think, about a couple of months now. So we'll have, uh, we intend to start that very soon. Okay. And then do you know, um, I know that there is a new test library that was added to LTP at some point. I don't know how recent that was. So in, in our work um, in AOSP, you know, we recently have been trying to expand the syscall coverage, the testing coverage to, to cover um, all the syscalls we depend on in AOSP. And one thing that we commonly run into is that some of the, the older tests for syscalls are based on the old version of the test library in LTP. I have a feeling that if the DDT tests are, are dependent on the old test library, that's going to be one of the, the uh, you know, barriers to, to sucking those in. Yeah, so that's something we, uh, that's probably one of the immediately next items after Connect where we'll try and see if we can merge it with LTP or, you know, do a rebase over LTP and see how good or bad it fares. Okay, thanks. So if there are no more questions, uh, we're at the end of slides. Thank you all for joining us.